Well, I feel to share tonight about a word from God. And so I was quite interested to hear where you were going, Apostle Emmanuel, you know, when you were just flowing in the Spirit before um, you invited me to come and speak. Because, you know, the greatest impartation in our lives, I believe, is a word from God. I've said for years and years now, if I've got a word from God, I can stand against anything. If I've got a word from God, I can achieve anything that God calls me to achieve. If I've got a word from God, no opposition, no obstacle can stand in my way. Such is the power of having a word from God. Yeah? And um, so I want to talk about that tonight because this conference is about um, apostolic and prophetic impartation. And, um, and you know, both apostles and prophets, um, well, maybe I should say true apostles and prophets because there's a lot of stuff out there. You know, still that's got to be sorted amongst the apostles and prophets. But I believe that true apostles and prophets primarily impart through the word that they speak. And then what happens for it to become a word from God for us is the work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah? It's the Holy Spirit who imparts truth into us. And the amazing thing is that we can be preaching and teaching the word that God wants to, the hearers to hear, and yet it's amazing all the other things that the hearers hear. Come on, are you getting me tonight? I've got five points tonight, but I actually don't want you to necessarily go home remembering the five points. What's most important is that in amongst everything we talk about, that you get a word by impartation for the, from the Spirit of God for what He wants in you and through you. Yeah? Hallelujah. So Ephesians 1, 17 to 19. Why don't we go there to start with? And then we're going to, um, well, I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to unfold a story in the, in the Word of God. But Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 17. Paul says, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Now he talks about four things here, but the first one is that we get revelation and wisdom to go with it. And it's not to make us feel good. It's actually so that we know him better. Because it's all about him. In the kingdom, it's all about the king. Do you know it's actually not about us? (laughs) Come on. It's not about you. (laughs) Just thought I'd put a bit of an edge on it, you know. (laughs) And it's not about me. It's about him. And so Paul's praying for the Ephesian church. And the very first thing that he says he prays about is that they would have a spirit of wisdom and revelation. In other words, that the Holy Spirit would be at work imparting into them. And what was the impartation going to be about? It was going to be a word from heaven that would reveal God to them more. Wow. You know, I went to Bible college, but I've actually learned more since then. I actually don't preach what I learned in Bible college because we walk with the spirit of wisdom and revelation. The Holy Spirit himself, that's who he is. And he's within us. Yeah? Come on, is this a true statement or not? Yes, it is. Yeah. He's in us. So therefore, we must be fountains of revelation. We walk in revelation and wisdom. And first and foremost, it means we know him more and more and more and more because everything flows from him. Everything comes from him. It's all about him. Without him, we don't even have our breath. Come on. And then he says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. So the spirit of wisdom and revelation turns light bulbs on inside us. Yeah? So that you may know what is the hope of His calling. I have to tell you, your calling is not yours. It's His. 
Come on, we, we've got to change our language, eh? My church, my ministry, my gifts. You know, no, 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 no. They're his. Yeah? They're his. But you know, we need our eyes to be opened to know that they're his. Because we've been taught something else. Well, I was anyway. Maybe you were taught this stuff from scratch, but I wasn't, all right? <laughs> so you may know him, that you may know the hope of his calling, that you may know what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. This is not about us pursuing blessing. This is about us being fully furnished for his work. Come on. Because in a kingdom, it's not about the subjects. It's about the king. <laughs> yeah? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power? It's all about him. When we make it all about him, then the Holy Spirit can actually be who he is in and through us. Unlimited, unhindered. And then revelation flows. Impartation comes from heaven. Yeah? Yeah? So you know what, I want to pray again before we go any further. I want to pray that the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of wisdom and revelation, will so move upon us tonight that our mindsets will be changed. That it won't be about us anymore, it'll be about Him. Yeah? Come on, why don't we briefly stand and I'll pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you live in us and you are God. And we thank you that because you dwell inside us, spirit of wisdom and revelation, we can walk 24-7 in your wisdom. We can walk 24-7 in the revelation you give us. We can walk in a revelation dimension. And I pray, Holy Spirit, now let this dimension be upon us, moving amongst us as you, as you minister into our lives, as you speak into our hearts, that throughout everything that I say from here on, Lord, that there will be a river of revelation flowing in this place tonight. That there will be a river of revelation flowing in each of our hearts and minds so that we will receive impartation from above, so that we will receive impartation from you, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, that we might ha not have wisdom from above, that we might have revelation to know Him and to know the hope of His calling, to know His furnishing in our lives and to know His power, hallelujah, to fulfill His will in the earth. Hallelujah. So Lord, I just pray right now that let everything else be gone and let there only be the river of revelation in this place amongst us in our minds and our hearts now in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. 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 Well, you may be seated. And um, I want to talk to you for the rest of my time about a lady called Mary. She was a teenager. And, um, you know, she was uh, engaged to be married. Or actually, she'd been promised to be married to a man. And um, this man... In, in her culture, was some years older than her. He was most probably somewhere around 30 years old, but she was most likely still a teenager. And, um, and so as a teenager, she's already promised in marriage to this man. Now, this doesn't happen much in a country like Australia, <laughs> right? And I know that for many, many migrants who come to this nation, you know, a lot of these kind of cultural things eventually can get broken down. But I'm sure that some of you already are linked in onto what I'm talking about, about this situation. So her life was going to be at the appropriate time to actually be given in marriage to this man. And, um, and then uh, her lot in life or her destiny was to bear his children primarily and to keep the home and to work alongside him perhaps uh, depending on what they did. Well, this man that she was promised in marriage to, he was the town's carpenter. All right, so I don't know what kind of role she might have had in his business, if any, but th her life was set for her. Her future was set in stone for her by her culture, 
by her own family and by the fact that she'd been promised in marriage to this man, was going to bear his children uh, and was going to serve him, etc. But one day, God stepped into that picture. Come on. One day, God stepped into that picture. Because it doesn't, didn't matter what she thought her future was going to look like. What mattered was what her creator knew her future would be. Yeah? But it required an encounter with God, an impartation that would change everything about her. So let's go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 and um, verse 29. And the way she encountered God was that God sent an angel to her. Now I have to tell you something. I've had, uh, well, two, that are, two um, encounters with angels that I can think of right away, but I think there's another one as well. But you know something? None of the encounters with angels that I've had are any substitute for the relationship I have with the Holy Spirit. There's been a lot of crazy teaching over the last years about angels, but I have to tell you, they are serving spirits. They serve the will of the Father. They'll never be sons of the Father. The Holy Spirit who lives in us, he is way above angels because he's God. Come on. But at times, God uses angels in very unique and specific ways, all right? But I'm saying what I'm saying now so we don't get our focus shifted away from the work of the Holy Spirit, all right? Just the fact that this is about Mary encountering the angel. So what happened in, um, uh, in this encounter was, uh, verse, sorry, verse 26 of Luke 1. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David and the virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favoured one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. You know what? She'd not only never heard those words before, she'd never seen herself like that before. Do you know what apostolic and prophetic impartation does? It changes our perspective. This, this girl, you know, this teenage woman who was promised in marriage to this man, her, her destiny, her future was set in stone apparently. But God sends the angel Gabriel who came and totally dismantled that whole picture. Yeah? All she saw herself of as was a Jewish girl growing up in Nazareth. And her lot in life was to get married to who she was promised to. She didn't have a choice in it. And to bear his children and there was life for her. I want to tell you something. I don't know what your picture of yourself is, but I'm betting it's not God's picture of you. <laughs> yeah? You know, I, I, some of you know this. I, um, my parents were missionaries in Papua New Guinea for 20 years. You know, we were very poor during those times. Um, churches in Australia would help us, like at Christmas time, they'd send parcels. But you know what? It was always second-hand clothes. So over time, you start to form a picture of yourself. Yeah? And then when I was turning 10 years old, I was sent away from my family to come and live with a family in Brisbane that I did not know. So I could get an education here in Australia. I didn't see my family for two years. You know, those kind of things shape the picture you have of yourself, yeah? You hear what I'm saying? Yeah. Some of you have experienced way worse things than that. This young woman had a picture of who she was, but it wasn't what was in God's mind. Yeah? Yeah? Her family had a picture of who she was, but it wasn't the picture God had. Do you know, if the picture in our minds about ourselves and about our future 
about who we are and what our purpose in life is and what our destiny might be is shaped by what our life's been till now, then I'm betting that picture is not what God's got in mind. God's got a whole other picture because he knew us before we were conceived in our mother's womb. Come on, folks. Come on. And if he could picture the earth being created and everything that's on it being created because he spoke words, then guess what? If he could picture that and then speak it into being, then he can picture your life and my life according to his will, according to his purposes, according to his heart, and he can speak it to us and speak it into being so that our destiny and our future is according to his will and plan and purpose, not according to the plan and purpose of man or circumstance or any other thing. So a word from God changes our perspective. Yeah? Yeah? does I remember the first time somebody called me man of God it was like what that wasn't how I saw myself at the time but something began to change because someone saw me as a man of God wow you hearing what I'm saying tonight I, I hope there's revelation just pouring into your heart already yeah because this is about impartation do you know, impartation doesn't require laying on of hands. Did you know that? It can involve that, but it doesn't require it. Impartation does not require being prayed for. It can involve that, but it doesn't require it. Impartation requires grace and the word being spoken, but in such an environment that the Holy Spirit's at work, like in creation, where the Holy Spirit was moving on the face of the water and then God spoke a word and boom, stuff happened. Do you know when God speaks a word to us about how he sees us, boom, something changes. Our perspective changes. Our perspective of him changes. Our perspective of us in him changes. Wow. Our perspective of what the possibilities might be for the future change. Awesome, hey? Number two, a word of God, a word from God reveals favor. Many of you would have heard me preach many times that sons have the favor of their father. Yeah? We don't have to ask God for favor. I remember back in the 80s, it was, you know, I heard this teaching and I used to, you know, get into prayer and, oh God, give me favor. And I look back on that and I think, I wish I knew about sonship then. I don't have to ask God for favour, not with him or with people. Right? We walk in favour because we're sons of our Father in heaven. His favour goes before us because we're his sons. And it's not just the favour to get good things. Favour is actually mostly the enabling to fulfil his will and plan and purpose. When his favour goes before us, it prepares the way for us to step into his purposes and to outwork his purposes. Wow. So if we have an encounter with God, hear a word from God that changes our perspective of ourselves and we begin to see ourselves the way he sees us, then what happens is that the word that comes alive in us actually reveals God's favour. We begin to see it. Let's look at the next two verses. Luke 1, 29 and 13. When she saw the angel, she was troubled. At his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. So she's confused. She's starting to panic a bit, right? Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. Well, that's a good start, isn't it? Don't be afraid. You see, if God sees us in a greater way than how we see ourselves, then there's nothing to fear. We can lay everything down and step into the picture that he has. Isn't that good? All right? Do not be afraid, Mary. Why? For you have found favour with God. The angel didn't say, say, don't be afraid, just ask God for favour. He didn't say, well, you, you might have favour with God, but you're going to have to work a bit on having favour with man. 
There was none of that stuff. He said, you have found favour with God. And I want to declare tonight that because of how God or the picture God has of us, we have favour with him. We walk in his favour. No, no, and, and that's not, not because we deserve it. It's because of how he sees us. Wow. I'll just let that one hang in the air for a bit. It's not because of how we've seen ourselves. Because of how he sees us, we have his favour. We've got to learn how to walk as sons of our father learn how to walk in this favour and understand it, but the favour gets revealed to us, in us, through us, through a word from God. You see, God sent this angel to say these things to Mary as though God himself was speaking to her. These things are, were a word from God to this young woman and totally changed her life, revolutionised it for the purposes of God in the earth. Yeah? Yeah? And we all know that Jesus, the Messiah, the King of the Kingdom, was actually birthed into this world through this woman. She had to see herself differently because she was going to carry the King of Glory. <laughs> yeah? Come on. Do you know, we have to see ourselves the way God sees us because we also carry the King of Glory. He lives in us. Yeah, He does. So we have to see ourselves the way he sees us. And we have to see the favour that is ours and that is upon us and goes before us to enable us to walk as though we are carrying the King of Glory. Wow. The more I began to get revelation about being a son of my Father in Heaven and also a son to spiritual fathers, the more I walked in favour. It's because the favour gets revealed the more you be, have an understanding of who you are in him. The more we see ourselves the way he sees us. Amen? Amen. Number three, a word from God establishes destiny. It establishes destiny. You see, Mary had a destiny already. Yeah? She did. She was going to be a wife and a mum. And by the way, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Unless God's got a different idea. She did become a wife and a mum, but she had a far bigger destiny than being a wife and a mum. Yeah. Firstly, she was mum you know, to the, the Messiah, the Saviour of the world, the Son of God in the flesh. But you know, we read here in verse 31 to 33... The, the, the um, angel Gabriel says, And behold, you'll conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you'll call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Oh, wow. All of a sudden, she's not just going to be a wife and a mum. She's going to actually be the mum of the person who's going to change the world. Like nobody else ever has and like nobody else ever will. Yeah? So question. What kind of destiny might God have in his mind for us that we haven't seen yet? You see, if we can still only see the picture that is ours then we're going to struggle to see God's picture. We're going to struggle to walk in favour. But also we're not going to be fulfilling that greater destiny perhaps. We might try to, yeah? But you know something? A word from God lifts us out of the mundane into the supernatural. A word from God changes up our destiny so that you know, like she, was still, she still became a, a mum and a, a you know, husband and a mum, right? And yet her destiny was so far greater than what she ever thought it would be. True? I'm still the son of missionary parents, but you know, I still sometimes 
You know, as the saying goes, have to pinch myself with what God has given me since I encountered him and got a word from him about what he had in mind. <laughs> and the favor I could walk in if I learned how to be a son. Yeah? And the, the largeness of the destiny that he had in mind, which I had no clue about. You know, I was saying here recently that when I was a young preacher, my dream was to, to grow and lead a church of a thousand people. Because in the 80s, that was like a big deal. <laughs> Do you know, if I had stuck with my picture of myself, I wouldn't have what God's given me today. Yeah? But a word from God changes it all. A word from God begins to unlock things that we've never seen before. A word from God begins to unlock possibilities we don't know exist. A word from God means that the future can be what God has always intended, no matter what people have done or said, no matter what failings or mistakes or sins we've done, no matter what our past has been or anything else, a word from God changes the future. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. This woman has been blessed for generations, over centuries, because of what this word from God was that came into her life. That she will always be blessed among women. Wow. A teenager from Nazareth? You know, back in those days, the saying was, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? You know? We used to say that about places like Anala and Woodridge and, you know, can any good thing come out? So you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> I know that's terrible, but let's, we, we did, right? We said those things. <laughs> Well, in Jesus' time, it was, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Oh, yes. The King of Glory came out of Nazareth because this woman got a word from God. Yeah? Awesome, hey? All right? Just amazing. When you, when you, if you get this revelation, because I know it's revolutionized my life, <laughs> because this, this young teenage woman... She, is, she will be forever in history linked to the work of God himself in the flesh on this planet. That was her destiny, not just to be a wife and mum. Amazing, isn't it? All right, number four, a word from God lifts us into the supernatural. Lifts us out of the natural into the supernatural. And those of you who have heard me you know, speak and teach over recent years, I can't get away from the fact that not only is God able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what we ask or think, I believe, I've come to believe, this is how all of us are supposed to live in the kingdom. This is our destiny, to live in the exceedingly abundantly beyond what we can ask or think. Anything less than that actually um, reduces what Christ has done. We are destined to live in the supernatural. We're destined to live in the, as spiritual beings that just happen to be housed in a human body. Do you know why I say that? Because we are seated, not going to be one day, we are seated in heavenly places with Him. And where is He seated? At the right hand of God the Father. Wow. You see, we are destined to be lifted out of the natural into the supernatural and we're supposed to stay there. You know, Paul said in Romans 8, you are not in the flesh. Everybody say that. I am not in the flesh. Say it again, please. And another time, please. You probably need to go home and say it into your mirror or when you're sitting on the loo or something about a million times. Until the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. Yeah? Because in our heads we're all saying, oh, yeah, I'm saying the words, but yeah, I'm in the flesh. This is why we say, Holy Spirit, come, when actually he's already inside us. Yeah? Where's he gone? He hasn't gone anywhere. He's inside you. Yeah? He is inside us. So Paul said... That it, basically he was saying, if the Spirit's in you, then you're in the Spirit. 
Now, I was taught, you know, and I used to lead worship years ago, you know, on a weekly basis, etc., etc. And it was all about, well, let's come into the presence of God. Well, you know, we walk in His presence every day if we understand we're not in the flesh, we're in the spirit. Yeah. We don't have to come into anywhere. When we get together and begin to worship together, then yeah, the, you know, the, the presence of God gets manifested in a greater way or another dimension or whatever. But the fact is, His presence is in us every moment of every day. And Paul said, you are in the Spirit. You're not in the flesh. You know, we've got to, got to actually get this revelation. This is a word from God to us which was written 2,000 years ago, but it's just as powerful today. You are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit. Stop going back to the flesh is what Paul's message was. So we don't live fleshly all week and then try and get into the Spirit on Sunday. We are in the Spirit 24-7 because He's in us. Yeah? So therefore we have to stay on point and not go back to the flesh, not entertain fleshly things. But a word from God is what lifts us out of all of that, right, into the supernatural. And when we stand on that word from God, then we stay in the supernatural zone. Then we stay in the spirit. My goodness. I wish the body of Christ globally could get this. Yeah? Because this revelation changes the game completely. It absolutely does. So a word from God lifts us into the supernatural and we're supposed to stay there. That's where we're supposed to live. That's where we're supposed to walk. Amen? I'm in the flesh there. (laughs) Luke 1, 34 to 37. Mary said to the angel, how can this be? I I don't know a man. In other words, I'm not married to a man. I'm not having sexual relations with a man. And the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. In other words, this is not about your natural perspective. It's not about your natural thinking. It's not about anything in the natural. This is about the Holy Spirit. This is a word from heaven, and it's about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Oh, come on. Therefore also, the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Do you know what those words did? That lifted her out of your know, natural thinking, out of a natural perspective. It lifted her out of trying to figure it out like Nicodemus did, you know. How can I be born, you know, again? What's this all about? But see, Nicodemus didn't get a word from God that changed his life. Not in John 3 he didn't. But Mary got a word from God that changed her life forever. Wow. Yeah. And then the angel said, Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. Wow. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. Do you know, it doesn't matter what you've been called. It doesn't matter what label's been put over you. God's got a different name for you. That's the truth. He's got a different name for you. And then he said, for with God, nothing will be impossible. Do you know, it's not impossible for us to live in the spirit 24-7. It's actually where we're supposed to be. It's not just for some elite group to live in the exceedingly abundantly beyond what we can ask or think. That's where we're supposed to live because we live in the spirit. Yeah? Yeah? And so what the the word from the Lord that was doing here was lifting her out of natural thinking, natural deduction, natural reasoning, and saying, "Let let it go. Let the Holy Spirit do his work. Because what you think's impossible is a breeze for him. In fact, what you think is impossible is what he wants to do. (laughs) He wants to do the impossible. You know, Elizabeth got pregnant and had a, conceived a son in her old age. And before that, she was called barren. Wow. But the Holy Spirit came upon her. Mary had never had sex with a man, but the Holy Spirit came upon her. And she conceived a son also. Wow. Both these women were lifted out of the natural into the supernatural. 
And this is the whole point about a word from God. If we've got a word from God, we no longer live naturally, we live supernaturally. If we've got a word from God burning in our spirit, we no longer think naturally, we think according to the spirit. Because our minds are set on the things above, the things of the spirit. Amen? Hallelujah. All right, the last one tonight. A word from God establishes us in God's purposes. All right? So verse 38 of Luke 1. Then Mary said, so finally, Mary's got it. Finally, this word has become a revelation to her. Finally, things have shifted because of the word from God. All right. Mary said, behold, the maidservant of the Lord. Who was she talking about? Herself. Now she's no longer a teenage girl promised in marriage, marriage to some 30-year-old bloke as a carpenter and her destiny is going to be wife and mother. Now she's saying, behold, the maidservant of the Lord. She's now confessing what the word from God has transformed in her life. Wow. Behold, the maidservant of the Lord. Uh, of the Lord. And then she said, let it be to me according to your word. Come on. According to his word. You know, when the Bible says it is written, then it's written in stone. It never changes. When God writes a word on our hearts, because the Holy Spirit speaks it, either through a prophetic word, through an apostolic word, through the teaching of the word of God, or even sometimes then, you know, when we're just in a time of prayer or when we're crying out to God in a time of trouble, it doesn't matter what the circumstance or the vehicle that it comes through, a word from God will transform us. A word from God will lift us out of the trouble, not just to have relief, but so that we are seated in heavenly places and can live from victory and can live with authority and power. A word from God actually opens our eyes and so that we can see him for who he is to us. We can see who we are in him. And a word from God opens, uh, changes our perspective. A word from God lifts us out of the natural into the supernatural. So we walk as sons of the Father in his favour. The word from God establishes the destiny that he has determined for us. And a word from God establishes us in his purposes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, I don't need another prophetic word, and I'm not being negative about prophetic words by saying that. All right? But I can tell you, I don't need another prophetic word. Because the words that have been imparted into my life in all kinds of ways have produced what I've talked about tonight. And this is for all of us. I can only preach this because it's my experience, it's my walk with God. So this is not theory tonight. <laughs> all right? Some of you know, but some of you wouldn't know. I now have, we, we now have um, apostolic network in 22 nations. And by the way, we are doing nation building projects that over time are going to revolutionize some of those nations. God's given us strategies in partnership with you know, our covenant brothers, our sons in the faith in these nations. Do you know, back in the 80s when my dream was to have a church of a thousand people, Man, I didn't see what God saw. Come on. But a word from God begins to change it. And then a further word builds on it. And another word builds on it. And when you've got a word from God, then you, your direction is set. Yeah? And if we'll simply understand that we are in the spirit, not in the flesh, then we can stand on the word that God's spoken into our hearts with all confidence and with all humility and with patience because that word's going to get tested. The Bible teaches us that. It does, it gets tested. So you know you get this prof great prophetic word over your life from somebody and then next thing you're going through hell. Most of the prophetic people don't tell you that might happen. But let me tell you, that's most likely going to happen. Because we've got to learn to get that word into our spirit and stand on it. You know, Mary had some times when she wondered about what was going on with Jesus, yeah? But then there was other times like the wedding at Cana when she said to them, whatever he tells you, do it. Where did that come from? 
It came because she had this word in her heart. She carried it in her heart. It was built deep inside her. Its roots went deep. Yeah? So that no matter what happened, that was the thing that gave her focus. That was the thing that caused her to rise up. That was the thing that caused her to have faith and trust in God. Amen? A word from him. Let's stand and pray.